moment, or I'm sure you will talk about the slide, existence in three D space time. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so um, let me write down the title to begin. Um, so implied existence. for 3D rave dynamics. So what I'm interested in is, let's say, the following question. So what I'm going to ask is, does the existence of a set of closed rave orbits um, and usually with certain properties, so if you know that there are certain rave orbits, can you deduce the existence of other rave orbits? So this is the question I'm going to try to try to address. And uh, mostly, I'm going to illustrate it with a particular example. Um, but anyways, let me, let me start with the setup here. So v is going to be a 3-manifold. And actually, most, for most of the talk, v will just be the tight 3-sphere, the 3-sphere. C is going to be a contact structure. And what I'll have is. Let's consider L P to be a, a finite collection of closed loops, so closed transverse, so transverse to the contact structure. And what I'm going to do is, um, well, also, for this talk, I'm going to have, so let L be, let me label the components L1 to LK. And then I'm also going to have to specify some numbers theta. So I'm going to let theta1 up to theta k be a collection of irrational numbers. Um, which are eventually going to be Conley Zender indices of these of these orbits L. Um, okay. Actually, let me let me say that more clearly. L is going to be. So I'm gonna. Well, right now they're just loops, and I'm gonna sort of be. Yeah. Um, most of the time. Um, well, I'm going to be considering them and all their iterates as well. So, I mean, so these Conley Zender indices imply, so the Conley Zender indices of these guys are going to be, of the kth iterate will be 2k theta 1 plus 1 and so forth. So they'll be non degenerate and all their iterates will be non degenerate elliptic. So that's going to be the assumption for the rest of this talk. So L is going to be a collection uh, of closed non degenerate. Rave orbits for a contact form lambda. Okay. All right. So to this data, I'm going to assign. Well, so I'm going to assign um, a chain complex. Well, if it exists, um, so so I'll assign a chain complex uh, using some data. So the data I need are so lambda is going to be a contact form, and what we're really interested in is the dynamics of this contact form in the first place. Okay, um, and then we also need an almost complex structure. Um, on C, which is compatible with D lambda. And using this data, um, what we can define is 
a chain complex, um, which I'll denote like this. So lambda j, and I'll write rel l theta. This is just notation, which is really just going to be the contact chain complex, cylindrical contact chain complex. Um, uh, of um, so v c with this data lambda j, well rather on. So on the complement of this loop, so it's in v minus l actually. Okay. So let me let me say what this is exactly. Um, so this is it's a chain complex generated by closed ray orbits for the ray vector field. So some coefficients, let's say q times some variable associated to the, to the closed orbit. And probably I should have said already by now, I apologize, that we have this ray vector field, x lambda. Well, x ray vector field, which is defined by two equations. So when you plug it into the contact form, you should get 1 everywhere. And when you plug it into d lambda, you should get 0 as a one form. So this defines a vector field. And very often, we're interested in the dynamics of this vector field. Um, for example, it's often the geodesic flow when it's the unit cotangent bundle of a, when you have a metric. Um, OK. So here's the chain complex. In the curve, so, so the cylindrical things are assumed not to hit this L lines. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So. I'll write that down. So when it defines a differential, uh, uh, which I'll just say roughly what it is. It counts holomorphic curves, so actually holomorphic cylinders, between closed ray orbits. And I think the only property, well, if there, are no, if there are no holomorphic curves, then, then d equals 0. So let me just note that. No holomorphic curves implies the differential is 0. Although, well, we're going to have, well, anyways, I'll explain a little. We won't quite be in that situation, but we'll be close to that situation in the, the cases we want to consider. OK, so it turns out that. OK, so. At this point, you haven't required that the. Uh, ah. Uh, yes. Yes. So I need to, yes, here. I'm missing one, one hypothesis here. So um, I require also, in this construction, um, I require that the Conley Zender, so here's where these, these irrational numbers fit in. The Conley Zender index, which I'll denote just CZ, um, of the ith component. So the kth cover the ith component is going to be given by the following So if you have an, an orbit such that it is um, it's elliptic and non-degenerate for all of its iterates, then it turns out that its Conley gender indices has to satisfy some sort of a relation like this. Okay. So I just you know these are the numbers. So so I consider contact forms lambda such that, OK, so, uh, so lambda is such that, so first of all, L is closed uh, under x. So the ray vector field is tangent to, to all these loops L. And moreover, they satisfy. Uh, let's call this star. Star. The Conley Zender indices satisfy star. All right. Okay. So now. Um, given such a form, which satisfies, so given this data in a form which satisfies a contact form 
Uh, oh, and also, it should be it should satisfy. It should be a contact form for the original contact structure. So kernel lambda is equal to, to the contact structure. Given such a form lambda, um, you can construct this, this complex. And it turns out um, the homology of this complex, which I'll denote by just adding an h star after this, um, depends only on the data uh, the co of the contact structure, um, these loops L, and these rational numbers theta that are given. Okay. So, so to define this, let me just say a few words about what it takes to define this. Um, to define the chain complex, uh, or rather the differential, one requires that, first of all, the contact form is non-degenerate. And moreover, I also require um, that there are no contractible. And when I say contractible, I mean in, in V minus L. Okay. Um, closed orbits. The reason being, if you have contractible ray orbits, you might have some bubbling of planes, and this might ruin the, the fact that, might ruin the, the proof that d squared equals 0. Uh, can you always construct given, given any L and any theta, I don't know. If whether you can, for any V, L, theta, I don't know whether it can be done. But it certainly can be done for certain ones. So. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to construct, I mean, I'm going to calculate this for a certain example and show what that implies for the dynamics. So the first thing I'm going to do is just say that even though you need to, to require, you require that this is non-degenerate and um, that there are no contractible ray orbits, I mean, you can still, you can still prove, so right theorem. Um, so given V, C, so given the three manifold, the contact structure, these closed orbits, and these ro rational rotation numbers, um, if you can find a, f if you can find a contact form lambda <coughs> satisfying all these requirements. So it's non-degenerate, has no contractible ray orbits in the in the, the complement. Its kernel is C. Um, it's tangent to these loops L, and the Conley's end indices have all these irrational um, yeah, numbers. Um, all these requirements. If so if the result um, how did I note this? So let's call this C, and I'll, I'll do, so let's note this rel L theta. So if we need to take the homology, you can, if for some form you can define it, you get non non zero answer for the homology. Then, then, yeah, yeah, and if this is not equal to zero, then there exists a closed orbit. Actually, now let's let's bring in one more thing into the picture. So, this chain complex, um, you can split it according to hom homotopy types of the loops x. Okay, so x sum over a is equal to homotopy type, and then for x sum loops in a. And the differential will split according to this because you're you're going to count homomorphic curves that don't intersect this, don't intersect um, don't intersect L. So what you get is the homology in each component A. So you can add, so you can look at that component of the homology. And non-triviality will actually give you a closed orbit in the homotopy class. 
x of a. So that's a nice thing about removing loops is that you know you start with a three sphere which has no topology. Once you remove some things, you generate a little bit of topology, and you might find some some critical points that you didn't find before. That's the, the rough idea. So I'll try to sketch this proof at the end. But, um, but first, I want to describe what, what the answer, what you get when, for this in, in one particular example. And it's basically the simplest exam non-trivial example I can think of. So in this example, we're going to take V to be the tight 3 sphere. So there's a unique contact structure called the tight contact structure. Um, I'll write down formulas for all these. So V will just be the unit sphere in in C2. And if I have polar coordinates on each, each component, so R1, theta1, R2, theta2, sort of polar coordinates in each C component, then uh, my contact form, well, we'll consider contact forms of the type f times lambda 0 where lambda 0 is 1 half r1 squared d theta 1 plus 1 half r2 squared d theta 2. Okay. Um, and my link is going to be, let's call, let's call it L. L1, it'll have two components, and it'll just be the Hopf link. So it'll be the intersection of S3 with the first component will be just the part where the second component is equal to 0. Um, intersected with, with that. All right. And um, I'll be given a pair of rational numbers. Actually, using the notation, the Collins energies will actually be 1 plus theta 1 and 1 plus 1 over theta 2, because we'll actually use if I'm consistent with what I wrote there. OK. So what I'd like to do is compute the following. So theorem, given this, so let's write this as this. Um, actually. Before I do that, let's just note. So S3 minus this link is um, you know, homotopy equivalent to the two torus. So uh, the homotopy classes can be parameterized by, by loops P and Q, I mean by, by two numbers, P, Q. So I'll write the homotopy class A is given by P, Q. And to be specific, um, there'll be, so if I take a representative in A, um, an element in A, I'll denote it PQ if it loops with the second component P times and it links with the first component Q times. Okay. I think that's the convention I want. Um, okay. So given this, those irrational numbers theta there, one can compute that. Let's write PQ. Is equal to, so it depends. There are several, there are some cases here. Um, OK, so case one. So the first case is uh, if, um, let's say, let's say 0, let's say these numbers are positive first. Okay. Then what finds is that um, um, what finds that this is equal to So I'll forget the grading for now. It's 
has um, dimension two if um, here we want if q over p is in the interval between theta one and theta two, or uh, can you see this at all? It's m missing. No. Okay. Sorry. Um, let's move over here. It's equal to, has rank 2 if q over p is in the interval between theta 1 and theta 2, or if um, theta 2 is less than theta 1, then it's in this interval, and 0 otherwise. Um, if we have theta 1 is less than 0 is less than theta 2, which we can, if only 1 is positive and 1 is negative, we can always arrange that this is the case, then the answer is um, q2 if qp belongs to this interval, theta 1, theta 2, and with the convention that the denominator, take the denominator positive, and if, if this number is negative, then q is negative, okay? And 0 otherwise. Um, and finally, if they're both negative, then one has a similar answer. If um, so, here, if q over p is in the interval theta one one, where here p is positive, or if Q is positive and Q over, sorry, P over Q now belongs to the interval 1 over theta 2, 1. It's one way of writing this. Okay. So, I mean, in any case, uh, we could, as. It, it, so, roughly speaking, it just says you have this link and, and the flow and the condensing index says that near the links things have to turn in a particular direction. Exactly. At a particular speed, this forces certain other phenomena. Yes. Whatever it is, but that would be philosophy. Yes, exactly. Uh, we, you know, we'll calculate this in a little bit of detail, so we'll actually see what's going on um, by constructing explicit forms with these properties. Um, there'll be more spot forms, but yeah. So combining this and then the theorem, um, this theorem, this shows that, you know, now if you just take so, any. So the twist theory would also be. So on the sphere? No, 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 okay. in general, but it was also about the phenomenal difference. You could yeah, you could take S2 cross S1 and, 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 and do with Hamiltonian structures and, and get uh, the same result. And it will look yeah, just like the twist yeah, theorem. Of course, you have more freedom with boundaries, et cetera. Yes, exactly. So, and also, so one could prove this if you have, um, if you have one of these planar um, like these open book, planar open book decompositions, right? This, this would follow from, from the, the existence of one of those because theta 1 would roughly be the, the rotation around the center orbit and theta two, 1 over theta 2 would be roughly like the rotation around the outer orbit. So if you have a difference, you should have a twist map and you could prove it that way. But this will work even if, you have, if, even if you don't necessarily have one of, these, one of these open book decompositions. I mean, perhaps you will always have an open I mean, it, it's still conceivable, but... Um, but yeah, you can. So this this applies even in the non dynamically convex case. And I would guess that I would guess that perhaps one can get rid of some of these irrational. Somewhat, a little bit, perhaps a little bit. Okay. Anyways. So I'll, I'll calculate this in some amount of detail. Now let me show one application. to GD6 on S2. OK. So, um, so first, let's, let's show how you can take the GD6 flow and lift it to S3. So if one has a metric 
on, on the sphere, then, I mean, so the geodesic flow is the same as um, if you look at the, the unit sphere bundle on the cotangent bundle um, with respect to the Liouville, the canonical one form, this is a contact manifold and this gives you the geodesic flow. Okay. So, but this, this manifold here is the same as, I mean, it's RP3 or actually it's SO, let's think of it as SO3. Then we have the double cover map. Um, the double cover map, which maybe I'll call G. So we can take this, this one form and pull it back. Um, and let's view this as the three sphere. Um, so we pull back this one form. And it turns out this will be a tight, tight form. Okay. So let's say we have. Um, Let's say we have a simple closed geodesic. On S2. Okay. Um, well, there's sort of two lifts up here. There's the one that goes in one direction and the one that goes in the other direction, right? So let's call these, I don't know, let's call okay, lift one and lift two. So if we look at there, the pre images so i mean by applying a diffeomorphism you could assume this was an equator and then just look at what this is you know when you when you when you take this the pre image and you get exactly this link i described before Um, so the last observation I have to make is that, so associated to this, um, to this geodesic, one gets a number rho called the inverse rotation number. Um, or some I've seen it also called sometimes Poincaré's inverse, inverse rotation number. Um, so this is defined, let's see how long. So rho can be defined as, as follows. I mean, it's a, it's a measure of the, the rotation of the flow around the, the geodesic. So one way to define it is, I believe, as follows. So one considers the The Jacobi equation. Um, so this is just a, a differential equation for t belongs to R. And one way to define rho would be as the average number of zeros of x in some interval zero n divided by to n, I think. So it turns out that this, this number is very closely related to the, the conley zender index. Um, back in the following way. So the relation between theta and these numbers, between rho and the numbers theta 1 and theta 2 that I wrote down before is exactly the following. So I'm going to choose theta 1 to be 2 rho minus 1. And then theta 2, is out, it'll actually be that 1 over theta 2 will be 2 rho minus 1. So this will be 1 over 2 rho minus 1. So as soon as rho is not equal to 1, these two numbers differ. And so we can apply the theorem. But unfortunately, we have to assume that rho's are rational because I, I needed to assume that theta 1 theta 2 are rational. So apply theorem, and one finds closed ray orbits um, which are 
up to a two to one count, um, close the geodesics. Well, double covers of closed geodesics. So, and this is a two to one count because you can go forward and backwards. And, yeah. and these are all distinguished. by the linking numbers with these uh, the, the double covers of, of the, the lifts of the geodesic. So one can show that there are infinitely many closed geodesics. So this is an analog of a, of a stronger result due to Anganen. So over there, he, so he proved So a stronger version of this result in 2005 in annals. Um, first of all, assuming only that this inverse rotation number is not equal to 1. And second, he had, um, I mean, he got a stronger topological restriction on these, on, on the GD6. He found GD6 are, have, what's known as the flat knot type of um, something called PQ satellites. Which are basically loops that kind of wind up and down and go around Q times and up and down P times. Um, but um, yeah. So I guess I could point out that. Uh, He's curve shortening flow. Yeah. But again, he did a curve shortening flow on the on the comp on like relative to this to this equator, equatorial GD6. So the philosophy is quite similar. Um, so I guess one could point out that this result also will hold. This this metric doesn't have to be Riemannian. One, the same result would hold also for a reversible fins are, for instance. Um, but the reversibility goes into the, the into getting the, the second the exactly, the exactly, so the exactly. Yeah. Okay. So I think I'll avoid there. <laughs> so. So I think, I think there's a good chance. I think there's a good chance that one can remove a rationality of, of these guys, um, still assuming that they're they're elliptic. Uh, so, so if you allow some rational numbers which are not integers, uh, yeah. So you'd have to do the compactness theorem in bare hands, but I think it should. I think that should be okay. Um, There's maybe a small chance if they're just odd hyperbolic, but uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. But I do, I do sort of believe that one could remove irrational, replace it with irrational. Okay. So let me construct the examples and show why we get this particular answer for these. Uh, for this, this setup, okay. So, um, all right. So, what I'm going to consider is I'm going to construct a star-shaped hypersurface in C2 to compute in this in this case. So, S3 tight contact structure relative to the hop link and given some rational numbers, theta 1, theta 2. Okay? So how does one do this? Um, okay. 
so the level set of my Hamiltonian, I'm only going to sp specify the level set of this Hamiltonian. So I have a function of, so h is going to be my Hamiltonian, um, and it's going to be a function of r1 squared and r2 squared, like this. Um, so my surface is going to be s in this level set of So my surface is going to look something like this. Um, so I'll have a, let's, let's draw it something like this. So this will be the surface S. So these are the points R1 squared and R, R2 squared, which give you h equal to 1. Um, so how do I? So I basically have to construct a curve with certain properties. So it turns out that the conley zender index is given so if I let this be the slope of this, of this normal line here, like this, if I call that theta 1, then the colleague zender index, so this, this point here on the line will correspond to the, the loop L1, right? Because R2 is equal to 0, so you get exactly this circle at the R1, right? So this will be L1. This point here will correspond to the other component of the hop link L2, <coughs> OK? Um, this slope here will be the, give you this, this theta 1, which gives you the Conley zender index. So which I'll just remind is is given by this relation. And this slope here, theta 2, so actually, I want you to think of it more as like this vector. Well, anyways, this slope, uh, that. Yeah, so this slope is theta 2, and Conley's under index of L2 is actually 2k, 1 plus 1 over theta 2 plus 1. OK. Um, and the, so to get a star-shaped hypersurface, uh, if one looks at the condition for being star-shaped, um, the condition actually turns out to be exactly that this curve, if, if to express it in terms of this gamma, um, it should just be that if you take the vector gamma and its derivative, this should always be not equal to 0. I star shaped. So you just construct curves with these properties and you get, and you get contact, well, you get hypersurfaces with these these dynamics. I don't know, I remind the, that star-shaped implies contact type. So okay, let's look at this in a little bit more detail. So the Hamiltonian vector field for this, this okay, so for such an h will be given by, so first of all, dh will be equal to 2 r1 um, dh by the first variable, so let's say dx, um, dr1 plus 2 r2 dh it's by its second variable, dr2, which gives you the Hamiltonian vector field xh is equal to um, so 2 dh by dx d theta 1 plus 2 dh by dy d theta 2. So in other words, the, the direction of grad h, or if you want to think in terms of the curve, it's the perpendicular to the, the velocity vector with the right orientation. Um, determines the slope of the ray vector field on the invariant torus R1, R2 is equal to const. 
right? Because this vector field is preserving, doesn't change R1 and R2, so you get this foliation by tori. And exactly this, this direction, so this normal direction, gives you the slope, the slope of the vector field in this torus. So as you slide along the curve in this direction, what you find is that every time you get to a rational slope, you get a tori foliated by closed array of orbits. Um, and, the sl and if you look at the, the homotopy class that they represent, A, of such orbits, um, one finds that it's just the ratio given by of, of these, two, these two slopes. So the homotopy class will just be PQ if HX over HY is equal to P over Q. And let's assume they're relatively prime, take them in those terms. So in particular, each point gives us a torus of closed ray of orbits, but they're disti the, the homotopy types are, are distinguished. right? So in each homotopy type, you have exactly one torus of closed ray of orbits. So what you can do now is, um, so you can appeal to a more spot calculation. will imply that the homology will be equal to the homology of the circle up to a grading shift. So I think you have to add 2p, 2p plus q basically to get this. So because you kind of have like a, a torus of closed ray orbits. So you kind of have, I mean, if you look in the loop space, you have a, a circle of, of critical points. So you break the circle up and you get, that's where this eighth s1 appears. And that's the calculation in this case. OK, so that proves the second theorem. OK, great. So I have a little bit of time to discuss um, the proof, how to prove, <coughs> how to get rid of the contractible orbits and the degeneracy hypotheses on the contact form. So. So suppose, so first of all, let mu be, I'll start with a non-degenerate form, such that um, um, that satisfies all the properties, except it might have closed, contractible ray orbits on the complement. So what exactly? Its ray vector field is, say, tangent to L. Um, the Conley tendencies of L I'll abbreviate this that they're just given by these irrational numbers theta. And n kernel, kernel of mu is equal to the context structure. So I mean, one would, this is almost enough to define the context homology, except that you might have contractible ray orbits in the complement that might ruin, ruin your construction. So, and that might, that, you know, then you can't apply just the, you know, the existence of the chain complex to do that there are closed ray of orbits. So the approach I'm going to do is, um, so take another contact form for which you can define you can define the chain complexes. So I should note that there's one can also do another argument where one sort of constructs the chain complex in each homotopy class, sort of bare hands, and then, and then, yeah. Well, well mm, actually, no, not quite. Yeah. Well, anyways, let's take another form in which we can define the chain complex. Um, so. So I take a constant c so that c lambda is, as a contact form, is pointwise larger than, so I mean, they're all sort of, so lambda is equal to some function times mu because they have the same contact structure. So I'm going to choose a constant, first of all, capital C, so that c lambda is equal to f times mu, where f is strictly 
larger than 1. Okay. And then I'm going to choose a constant little c such that this is equal to, well, g times mu, where g is pointwise strictly less than 1. So if I draw this in, let's draw uh, so if one looks at the simplexization, so in the simplexization, one has this picture. So here's, let's view these. This is v, and we have this is the r component. This is r times v, the simplexization of, um, of v. Um, so what, what I want to view this as is I have c times lambda up here and then little c times lambda over here, and then mu is some, some graph like this. Okay? And then I look at, so I construct uh, almost complex structures which define chain maps from, from here to here, from this chain complex to this chain complex. Um, so first you choose an r invariant j lambda up here. And then one uses, I guess you could use another one if you wanted, but let's use the same one down here. Um, and then you have some, you choose a, choose a mu invariant almost complex structure on this portion of the simplexization. And then choose some arbitrary, um, well, compatible almost complex structures here. Um, and from this, you get sort of, uh, so let's say that this portion here, that this portion here is biholomorphic to um, a symplectization, R invariant symplectization of this, of, of height R. And I'll call this whole complex structure JR. Okay? So I'm going to look at what looks at, uh, defines chain maps VR. by JR. Well, strictly speaking, one might have to perturb the JR, but um, one can, all one really needs is a holomorphic curve here. and One can produce a holomorphic curve by considering certain things. So, so what one knows is that this VR is um, it's a chain map which gives an isomorphism on homology so if you know that the homology for these complexes is non-zero then you know that this chain map is non-zero and this implies that you have some holomorphic curve for each r roughly And you know it's an isomorphism because you can homotope all this to, to a, a cylindrical, almost complex structure where you can really compute everything. I mean, yeah. So, so one stretches, and so you take a limit as r goes to infinity. And then by compactness, what you're going to find is S of t compactness. You're going to find some holomorphic building with several components. So you'll have, first of all, this R invariant component here. And then you have this homotopy here. And then you'll have this mu component. And then J1. And then finally, the lowest level, J lambda again, or C lambda. Um, and you get some sort of holomorphic building, which might have my bubble. Actually, might even bubble at this stage, let's say. No, no, actually, it well, couldn't. Um, so let's say we get some, some holomorphic building like this. Actually, it could bubble too. Actually, I suppose it can bubble there, but it could bubble there. Um, so, anyways, well, one starts off with a loop in A, which um, so 
so for the sequence of, of cylinders, you have sort of, you know, you have the sequence which starts off at some loop x and ends up at some loop y, uh, which is in the class A. And this one's in the class A as well. So closed ray orbits. Um, so in the limit, uh, if you just kind of follow your way down along, along this portion of the, the homomorphic curve, you'll find here that you have some asymptotic limits that are in the, in the right homotopy class. I mean, because these are contractible, you can see that they're, they're going to be in the right thing. So that's how you get the, the closed contractible orbit for, for the mu, even when there are contractible orbits. You just stretch and then look at what, what the resulting thing is. And now if, you're, uh, if mu is degenerate, um, what one does, you can take a, a sequence of non-degenerate approximating almost complex structures, I mean, uh, contact forms, and find these orbits. And then because one will have an action bound co coming from this action bound here, you have an action bound on these guys here, and you appeal to the zeroless goalie and find your limit. And roughly speaking, that's how the, the existence theorem goes, even when you have contractible or, or degeneracies. Um, Okay, so I mean, I guess I'll stop here and take questions.